Hello. Is this on? Yeah, okay. So I'm going to go through some pretty dense material pretty quickly, and so I'll be here afterwards if anyone has questions. My name is Harris Bassett. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer for Bitdeer. Bitdeer is a company with global presence. Most of our operations are here in the United States. In fact, we have um, a big operation just a couple hours from here in Knoxville. Um, we also have uh, our headquarters in Singapore. We have large operations in Europe and also South Asia. But the thing we're really known for and the thing that we focus on is technology. And among all the publicly traded Bitcoin mining companies, we're the only one really that focuses on technology. We have one fourth of our workforce involved in research and development. And I'm going to talk about the advanced technology that we're working on at Bitdeer. So we recently announced our ASIC roadmap, and you see that roadmap here. We are releasing chips at a fast and furious pace with a new chip coming out almost every other quarter. And that's much faster than the foundries release manufacturing processes. So we have to improve design for efficiency on every single chip. Of course, energy efficiency is the most important metric, and that's really what we're focused on. Um, and by the second half of 2025, we expect to release mining rigs with energy efficiencies of five joules per terahash. That's three times better than the best mining rigs available today. And I'm going to explain a little bit about how we're going to get there. So, you know, our Bitcoin community often talks about uh, energy, and we repeat Michael Saylor's quote about how Bitcoin is digital energy. Worldwide, we use tens of gigawatts of power. But where does that power actually go, right? How is it consumed? And how efficient can we be? What are the physical limits of that efficiency? And uh, how much more efficient can we become? Also, can we take the techniques that we've learned in Bitcoin and apply them outside of Bitcoin, like in AI or some other field? We'll look at that much more closely. So if you start off with, say, 100 megawatts at a, at a grid location, a substation grid, and then you have a data center right next door to it, you can typically get 80% efficiency within that data center. So, uh, that's 80 megawatts. The other 20 megawatts goes to cooling and power distribution. In fact, though, for Bitcoin, we're usually much more efficient than that because we don't spend as much energy on cooling. But for a good HP or AI data center, HPC or AI data center, 80% is pretty good. But we want to dive another step deeper. If you look at inside each system, which it could be a compute server or, for, in our case, uh, a, a Bitcoin mining rig, Inside there, about 90% of the energy is used by the chips, and the other 10% is wasted for cooling and power distribution, the same type of waste that you get in the at the data center level. We dive one level deeper and look inside the chip, and that's where we see we can get the most gains in efficiency, because right now, there's only about 65% of the energy that goes into the chip is actually used for switching. That means it's only 65% is actually used for calculating the SHA-256 algorithm, switching transistors uh, from 0 to 1 and 1 to 0. The rest of it is used for clocking, leakage power, and power distribution. So put a, a pin in this because we're going to come back to switching energy. It's the most important thing to get more efficient, and I'm going to show you how we're planning on doing that in our future generations. But first, before going to the switching power, I want to step back in time and look at the history of Bitcoin because that's actually pretty spectacular. So if you start off in January 3rd, 2009, the first block was mined by Satoshi Nakamoto using a CPU and software. And that was effectively, we're calling that the CPU era. Within two years, we had transitioned to GPUs, which were 10 times more efficient. And then within a year after that, we were on FPGAs, got another 10x efficiency. And then by 2013, we started the ASIC era, and we're still in the ASIC era now. And that was a 50x jump in efficiency when we went from FPGAs to ASICs. So in that first five years of Bitcoin mining, 
we had a 5,000x improvement in energy efficiency. That's really a spectacular achievement. But now let's look more closely at the ASIC era. And you see there that in the 12 years that we've been in the ASIC era, we've had another 1,000x improvement in efficiency. And this chart shows that. These uh, green dots represent each of the, well, many of the products that were released, and there's roughly a curve fit with the green line. You can see that we've divided the 12 years up into phases. Each phase represents a different semiconductor manufacturing cycle or process. So we started off with, say, 110 nanometers back in 2013. Now we're at four nanometers and quickly going down to three nanometers. But you can see that within each manufacturing uh, process, there have been improvements as well. You can especially see that in the 28 nanometer process where there's a significant improvement while keeping the manufacturing process the same. And that's really the function of design, circuit design improvements in the way that we're designing the chips. And if you look at the four orange dots on the right, that's our roadmap that I showed you earlier. And uh, I want to take a closer look at that. So looking at our roadmap, you can see that the green curve seems to be flattening. The energy efficiency is not improving as fast as it has been in the past. Our orange dots, which is our roadmap, dramatically improve the efficiency and change the slope of that line. And actually, if you, we extended that out, it would go quite a bit further. And the only way you can really do that is by changing your design techniques, changing the way you do circuit design. You can't do it by just relying on the manufacturing process. And by the way, everyone has access to the same manufacturing processes anyway. So let's look at the circuit design techniques that are used and how those can be used for energy efficiency. So this is roughly the three ways you can design circuits. You can use digital approaches, you can use analog, or you can use RF and microwave. This is certainly an oversimplification. Now you would think that for Bitcoin, because the SHA-256 algorithm is a purely digital algorithm, that you would use digital design techniques. Indeed, if you did that, you could use the high-level building blocks that the foundry gives you. You could synthesize the whole solution in software. You could do it using chip designers of ordinary skill, and you'd get done very quickly. But that chip would have horrible efficiency. It would not really be a chip that you could sell. So for the past nine years, since 2015, everybody that makes competitive Bitcoin chips has been using analog techniques. And in that case, you know, we're digging down into the details. We're throwing away the building blocks that the foundry gives us. We're using transistors and wires. We're dealing with voltages and currents instead of zeros and ones. It takes a lot more effort. It takes a lot more skill. It takes a lot more time. But you get the energy efficiency that we see today in Bitcoin miners. It's been used for the last nine years. But there are more aggressive techniques for circuit design. These are using distributed circuits and uh, uh, other th techniques, like uh, thinking about it in a much more fundamental level. You think about it at the elemental level of electromagnetic waves instead of voltages and currents. And it's a deeper understanding of what's going on. It allows you to get performance that could not be had any other way. So there is a lot more to do if we are willing to put in the effort. The problem is, though, that the RF and microwave techniques take yet even more skill, even more time, and it's just much more expensive to do that. And, well, the question really arises, why doesn't everyone use analog techniques to do digital uh, circuits? And the reason is that it would just take too much time. If you try to do a big Apple chip or an or a NVIDIA chip using these techniques, it would take forever. The chip would never see the light of day. But Bitcoin is different. Bitcoin is different because there's a tremendous amount of hierarchy in Bitcoin. The chip that you get might have a billion transistors, but that's really composed of several hundred or maybe a thousand SHA-256 cores. There are only a million transistors each. And then each SHA-256 core is composed of maybe 128 pipeline stages, which are only 10,000 transistors each. So you can apply the high level of skill and effort to that 10,000 transistor piece of the design, 
pretty small, and then just cut and paste it thousands of times to form the whole chip. So you can afford to put in the extra level of effort, the extra time, because it's highly replicated. And up until now, Bitcoin really was the only kind of chip that, or application that would support that. But recently, we also have GPUs that are used for AI. Now, GPUs have very similar hierarchy. They have a shader that's used thousands of times on a chip. Difference is that up until recently, GPUs didn't have the strong energy constraints that Bitcoin has. Bitcoin's had those energy constraints for a decade, and in a GPUs, that's just coming online. So if you can apply the techniques that we're applying to Bitcoin, to AI, we might be able to save a lot of energy there as well. So let's come back to what I told you about earlier, which is the switching power. This switching power is governed by an equation that has governed not just Bitcoin, but all of electronics since Nixon started his second term in office in the early 1970s. And that's basically that the switching power is equal to the capacitance times the voltage squared times frequency. Now, where that comes from is um, this is supposed to represent a chip where some of the nodes are one and shown in green, some of the nodes are zero and shown in black. And at any one moment in time, different nodes are one and different nodes are zero, but it's almost always exactly 50%. So the total average charge on the chip almost never changes. But every time a zero has to go to a one, you bring that charge in from the power supply. And then later, when that one goes to a zero, you flush that charge to the ground, meaning that you just use it once and then flush it. You don't reuse it, no recycling, and that's why that equation uh, is what it is. If you can recycle the charge, if you can just move the charge from where you don't need it anymore to where you do need it, then you theoretically don't have to bring any power from the power supply. In practice, we can get that down to where there's amount of power that you need from the power supply is reduced by 80% or 85%. And it's really by that recycling charge and that requires using distributed circuits. So can you do that? Can you do it in a practical way? Well, here's two examples that show you that you can. These circuits are moving charge around a circuit without drawing hardly any power from the power supply. They're not meant to hypnotize you, <laughs> but they sometimes have that effect. And uh, we, as I said, we're getting switching power now reduced by 75 or 80 percent from what that equation would predict. It's the first time. And it's the first time really in electronics that anyone's been able to do that for large digital chips. This will be applied to the chip that we're releasing at the end of 2025, about a year from now. I want to also give a shout out to Christian Huygens because we always stand on the shoulders of giants. And the equations that govern that circuit on the right were first laid down by Christian Huygens in the 1600s uh, when he uh, developed his invention, which was the pendulum clock. Very interesting set of equations. They cover a lot of things, actually. So one last power that's left. We covered clocking power and switching power. The other power that is often dominant in uh, all kinds of electronics, but particularly in Bitcoin, is leakage power. Leakage power is uh, basically the power that happens when electrons tunnel through barriers that should normally block them. And it gets worse and worse as you go to more advanced semiconductor processes because the transistors get smaller, and the smaller they are, the easier it is for the electrons to tunnel through. And the higher the temperature is, the easier it is. Oh, the, I mean, the leakage power actually increases exponentially with temperature. This one thing, leakage power, is the reason you can't operate your rigs above a certain temperature. Because if you do, the leakage power will just crush you. And so the foundries have been working on how to reduce leakage power. They go to spend billions of dollars. They've developed FinFETs back in the 16 nanometer generation. Uh, we're going to go to gate all around or ribbon fet technology in the next couple of years. But if you use our techniques, distributed circuit design, charge recycling, you can actually dramatically reduce leakage power. Those fats still help, but you don't need them nearly as much. So 
that's more or less the end of my talk, and I want to end by saying that we're just getting started. And um, you know, the era of ch charge recycling and distributed circuits has just started, and uh, Bitcoin, and actually BitDeer as well, is leading the way. And I think that these techniques are going to be very applicable to the GPUs that are used for AI and the savings in power that we can get by applying it to this much larger application might actually more than offset the amount of power that we consume as Bitcoin miners. So in the end, it could be that Bitcoin has a, a net negative energy usage if you attribute that savings to Bitcoin. Thank you. Next year, we are bringing the Bitcoin conference to the American West, Las Vegas. The brightest minds in the world will converge to deliver Bitcoin history. Buy your tickets now at b.tc slash conference slash 2025.